Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'll be taking a closer look at another scripture that is problematic for Jehovah's Witnesses and their beliefs. And that scripture is Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. Just to give some context, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that they are the one true religion that God approves of. And one of the reasons why they say this is that they follow what the Bible says. To stress this point further, they will say how humble they are when they see what they teach is not based on the Bible, they are willing to change it. For them, that's a sign of humility. Well, Matthew chapter 8 verse 11 is one of the best Bible verses you can show a Jehovah's Witness as proof that they don't teach what the Bible clearly states. And so in this video, we'll look at two things. First of all, the explanation of this verse and why it's fallacious and two how far they're willing to go to make their own teachings work even if it means jumping through hoops performing mental gymnastics uh, they'll go that far in order to protect their own teaching so why is matthew chapter 8 verse 11 a problem for jehovah's witnesses you might ask well jehovah's witnesses have a teaching that basically says that anyone who was faithful to God before Jesus came to earth, their reward is life on a paradise earth forever under God's kingdom. Now, this is a complete contradiction to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, because he basically says to his disciples that Gentiles will recline with the patriarchs in heaven that is Abraham Isaac and Jacob will be in heaven with Gentiles so how does watchtower explain away Jesus words how do they basically harmonize what they teach with Matthew chapter 8 verse 11 well I'd like to introduce to you the question from readers that is March 15th 1962 this has the most in-depth arguments for why they teach what they teach despite Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. Now notice how this question from readers was written by, I'm guessing, the reader. It says, how can Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, which speaks of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of the heavens, be harmonized with Matthew 11, 11, which indicates that not even John the Baptist will be in it? First of all, there's a few problems with how this question was written. Why would the Jehovah's Witness be concerned whether or not Matthew chapter 8 verse 11 can be harmonized with Matthew 11 11? The real problem here is why is it that the, the organization teaches that Abraham, Isaac and Jacob will be on a paradise earth despite Jesus' words in Matthew 8 11 which speaks of them being in heaven that's the that's the real question leave out the john the baptist part because that is also making a false assumption that matthew 11 11 talks about john not making it in heaven and it's not after you take a closer look you'll quickly notice that this is one of those question from readers that basically the governing body has drum up out of nowhere to try make a point to all Jehovah's Witnesses. Because in the same watchtower, there's another question from readers that actually give you details about the reader who wrote the question. This one doesn't, it leaves that bit out. And so you're led to believe that this is one of those questions from readers that the governing body has just wrote to basically teach something that they can't really teach otherwise. Because if you asked your average Jehovah's Witness what this verse actually means, it's more likely that they won't know what to say. They'll just basically ask to leave it with them and they'll research it when they can. And that exact experience basically happened to me. Um, I remember while I was still at home, I was talking to my mom and she said basically that, you know, we follow exactly what the Bible taught. Well, I said to her, if I was to show you one verse from the Bible, that contradicts what the organization is currently teaching, what would that mean? Now, I think it's quite important 
um, from experience that you basically ask a Jehovah's Witness, what would they do if you showed them something that proved their beliefs wrong? You know, the, what would you, what would that mean? Or what would you do? And basically, you can tell from the answer they'll give you whether or not they're willing to be honest with you. And that's basically the foundation for having a good discussion with anyone, really. It's honesty. So credit to my mom. She did allow me to show her this verse. All I did was read the verse and then she took the Bible out of my hands. She knew exactly what the topic was about. She read it for herself, looked back at me, read the verse again. She had to put on her glasses. She asked me to translate the Bible because we're using the JW library app. We, I translated back to her own mother tongue so that she could read it. Um, English is not a first language. She read it again and we ended up having a 40 minute discussion back and forwards about a lot of different topics, but all along the same lines of um, what Christians and to an extension, the patriarchs um, will look forward to as their Bible hope. And the conversation basically ended up with her suggesting that I write the, um, the society a question about these verses but i knew exactly how it's going to end up but that whole experience highlights one point that it was quite hard to take at first i believe anyone who's trying to help jehovah's witnesses they have to come to understand this truth i guess and that is jehovah's witnesses do follow the bible they brag about it they show it as evidence is why God has picked them as the one and true religion. They follow the Bible, but they rely on the governing body to tell them what the Bible means. So, for example, the Bible can say X. But if the governing body comes along and says, we know the Bible actually says X, but the Bible means Y. Jehovah's Witnesses will walk away believing that the Bible means why. It doesn't really matter what the Bible says. What's more important is what the governing body says the Bible means. And Matthew chapter 8 verse 11 is the best example that basically highlights this point. So we'll look at the arguments and what I want you guys to basically pay attention to is the evidence they give for why they believe what they believe. We're be providing their best arguments in number form, I guess, just for the sake of clarity and making it easy to follow and a bit more concise. So number one, the Watchtower brings another chapter of the Bible, that's Hebrews chapter 11, to basically make an argument that when Abraham was going to kill Isaac, he believed that God would resurrect him back from the dead, not to heaven, but here on earth. And again, this reasoning does not contradict Jesus' words. Because when Abraham was going to kill Isaac, don't question the morality. The reason why he knew that God was going to bring him back was because God made him a promise that through Isaac, the whole nation of Israelites will be produced. So why would Abraham all of a sudden think that Isaac would be resurrected to heaven? And so this argument, the first argument is easily dismissed. The second argument is they concentrate on an expression in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16. That is the expression that says, by now they, the patriarchs, are reaching out for a better place that is one belonging to heaven. So what the writers of this watchtower want you to believe is that when they say they were looking out for a better place, one in belonging to heaven, what they actually mean is that they were looking forward to living on earth forever on a paradise earth being ruled over by this heavenly kingdom. And it's not after you actually consult the context of Hebrews chapter 11. Again, this argument just simply falls apart. If you look at the context of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 16, 
In verse 13, you are introduced to this expression. Basically, it says that they publicly, they being the patriarchs, publicly declared that they were strangers and temporary residents. In the New World Translation, it says in the land. Now that expression in the land, it gives off the impression that, you know, they saw themselves as alien residents in their land, you know, in their country where they lived. And that's why they moved. But when you actually consult the kingdom interlinear, you know, the Greek for Greek, the literal Greek, the, the word that was supposed to be used is earth. So that was actually supposed to say they viewed themselves as temporary residents, aliens on earth. You see that whole, that the whole meaning of this verse changes. It goes along with what Jesus was saying. They did not look forward to living forever on a paradise earth. They viewed themselves as aliens. They were looking forward to a heavenly city. The translators of this new world translation would know this, but they purposely intentionally just translate instead of the word earth, they put in land so that their teachings can make sense. Again, this is how far they're willing to go. The third argument. Well, before I introduce the third argument, just quickly, they start bringing out what I call distractions. Basically, points that have nothing to do with any arguments of the actual matter. So and so said this, so it must prove Jesus' words wrong. Well, Jesus himself, um, they say that Jesus was speaking to some guy named Nicodemus, and Jesus told him that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not in heaven. Well, if you look at the conversation, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not even mentioned. So there's that dismissed. Next, they bring out King David. Again, this is not to, nothing to do with King David. So we can easily dismiss those. Now, the third argument or explanation. So their attempt at saying, okay, this is what it actually means. This is what the Watchtower says. It is therefore evident that in Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, Jesus referred to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob figuratively i want you to pay attention to the keywords evident and figuratively pay attention to the proof they give or lack thereof to support the idea that jesus statements are to be taken figuratively the what style continues on the occasion when abraham offered up his son isaac abraham represented jehovah god and Isaac represented God's only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who was offered up in sacrifice. Accordingly, Jacob represented the spiritual Christian congregation. Accordingly is one of those words that they love using. According to what? Accordingly, Jacob represented the spiritual Christian congregation, the kingdom of the heavens class, for just as the congregation gets life through Jesus Christ, so Jacob got life from Abraham through Isaac. Yikes. From this standpoint, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob mentioned together in Jesus' illustration. This is now starting to be turned into an illustration. Jesus' illustration would picture the great theocratic government in which Jehovah is the great theocrat. Jesus Christ is his anointed representative king and faithful victorious Christian congregations of 144,000 members is the body of Christ joined as in the kingdom. So basically, they want you to believe that Abraham pictured Jehovah, Isaac pictures Jesus, and Jacob the anointed. This watchtower was published in 1962. Back then, they still taught in types and anti-types. That is basically dramas or events that happen in the Old Testament foreshadowed what was going to happen in the New Testament. But back in 2014, the current governing body basically scrapped 
all these types and entry types in one single talk. David explains, sorry, I mean, David Splain gave a talk explaining why they don't believe in types and entry types anymore. And so when you see this on a timeline, you see guys basically just guessing what the Bible teaches so that their teachings can make sense. But here is the question. Who is to decide if a person or an event is a type if the Word of God doesn't say anything about it? Who is qualified to do that? We need to exercise great care when applying accounts in the Hebrew Scriptures as prophetic patterns or types if these accounts are not applied in the Scriptures themselves. If the study of a certain subject makes chills run up and down your spine, could it possibly be mistaken? And the answer is yes. Well, in recent years, the trend in our publications has been to look for the practical application of Bible events and not for types where the scriptures themselves do not clearly identify them as such. We simply cannot go beyond what is written. Our love should be for the truth and not for a particular doctrine or teaching. Well, how would you summarize this talk in a few words? The wrong answer is, we don't believe in types and antitypes anymore. We do. Where the scriptures identify them as such, we embrace them. But where the Bible is silent, we must be silent. Our love for Jehovah and for the truth will move us to receive this information gladly and with open hearts. So my question to the governing body of today, and in extension to Jehovah's Witnesses, where in the Bible does it say that Abraham represents Jehovah, Isaac represents Jesus, and Jacob the Anointed? Well, that's all I had to share in this video. Until next time, thank you for watching, and I hope what I shared can be of some use or benefit to my audience.